Thank you, Seth, and it's good to have you back, and it's good to be with all of you and have you back. We're coming to the end of our studies in the book of Joshua. We're in chapter 24, which is the last chapter. I'm not going to do the whole chapter. I'll finish it next week, but we're going to look at verses 1 through 15. So I'll read those verses. Before I do, though, I want to comment on the hymn we just sang, Elizabeth tries to coordinate the hymns with the text, and she does an excellent job of doing that. Uh, and this hymn reminded me of the very things I'm about to read to you in this third stanza. In His hands He gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. Well, that certainly is the message of Joshua to the nation in this final address that he gives to them. And while he doesn't say he bears them along or carries them along, that's certainly what he did. And I'll even bring that out in the lesson. But he certainly conquered all their foes. And, and that's uh, what Joshua will remind them of. Their complete dependence on the Lord. And so let me read it. And you'll see this, I think, as, as I do. But certainly it will bring it out in the lesson itself. Joshua 24, beginning with verse 1. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and their judges and their officers, and they presented themselves before, the, before God. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, from ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and to Esau I gave Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt by what I did in its midst. And afterward, I brought you out. I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And Egypt pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. But when they cried out to the Lord, He put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your own eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you into the land of the Amorites who lived beyond the Jordan. And they fought with you. And I gave them into your hand. And you took possession of their land when I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and summoned Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I was not willing to listen to Balaam. So he had to bless you, and I delivered you from his hand. You crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the citizens of Jericho fought against you, and the Amorite, and the Perizzite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Girgashite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Thus I gave them into your hand. Then I sent the hornet before you, and it drove out the two kings of the Amorites before you, but not by your sword or your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities which you had not built, and you have lived in them, and you are eating of vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt." And serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. Joshua 24 is a good passage for a New Year's sermon. The New Year is a time for reflection, self-examination, and resolutions that are usually broken and forgotten within weeks. But this chapter is not for one day of the year, but every day. In this last chapter of the book, Joshua gives the people of Israel a final charge to choose whom they will serve, God or idols. It was the choice the prophet Elijah gave to the nation Israel on Mount Carmel. How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal, follow Him. And really, that's the question that we all must answer for ourselves. Who or what are we going to serve? God or things? Joshua's answer was clear. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the charge and lesson of this passage. But before he gave the charge to choose, he made a case for choosing the Lord in verses 2 through 13 by reviewing Israel's history from the calling of Abraham to the conquest of Canaan. His reason was to produce gratitude in order to produce a response. So he did two things. He demonstrated that the Lord is the only God by recalling his overthrow of the heathen nations and their gods. And he recalled the Lord's goodness to them, to Israel, to show his loving care and to show his faithfulness to his promises. Everything that the nation had was a gift of God's sovereign grace. The point is plain enough God is real. The idols are false. God's unconditional love for Israel should move His people to respond to Him out of love and to serve Him only. So Joshua assembled the nation at Shechem to give this last sermon. Shechem is in the middle of the land. It's a convenient location for all of the tribes to meet. It's set between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. After the nation defeated and burned the city of Ai, it went to Shechem. Half of the tribes stood on Mount Ebal. Half of the tribes stood on Mount Gerizim. On Mount Gerizim, they read the blessings of the law. On Mount Ebal, they read the curses of the law. It reminded them that if they were obedient... They would be blessed, blessed greatly, blessed above all of the nations. But if they were disobedient, they'd be cursed. Now Joshua called them all back to the, the same place to give a sermon that would remind them of their obligations as God's people and the danger of unfaithfulness. When all the tribes had gathered there with the elders, the officers, and the judges... Joshua spoke to them, but not in his own words. He began, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. And God speaks through Joshua. Then directed by the Lord, he began recalling Israel's past, its, its history and origin, back to Abraham and his father Terah. The people take pride in their ancestry, or at least they want to. Uh, that's only human. So today, a lot of people are researching their family tree in the hopes of finding uh, someone of importance or distinction on it, maybe an ancestor who came over on the Mayflower, or maybe there's a president in there, or some war hero. Uh, no one has a more noble ancestry than the Jews. They're related to the patriarchs. Their father is Abraham. What could be better than that? The, that's where Joshua begins. But he didn't go there to boast. Just the opposite. 
really to give the people a dose of reality and show they have nothing to boast about. Their ancestry is dark, full of idols. From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. It's biblical to reflect on our past. In fact, Isaiah would later write, Look to the pit from which you are digged. Remember Abraham, remember Sarah. And Joshua did that here. Abraham was a great man. He is the example of faith. He is called the father of believers and the friend of God. That's high praise. But he was that only by the grace of God. And that is reason, the reason that Joshua goes back to that dark, unflattering past to remind the nation what he was and what the Lord did. And from Abraham's call out of Ur, east of the Euphrates River, it's, it's obvious that from the beginning, God had done it all. The, the history and life of the nation was the result of grace. Abraham was an idol worshiper in a heathen land. He was an unbelieving, undeserving man. Yet the Lord did not leave him there. For some reason, unexplained, at least unexplained here, he called him out. Verse 3, Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. It's clear that God was the initiator. I took your father Abraham. A later Jewish interpretation is that when God called Abraham, he did it only after first calling all of the nations. And when none of them answered, Abraham responded. And so God chose him. Now, that is so like human nature to spin things in its own advantage. The opposite is true. The central fact in all of this review of Israel's history is God's work. I took, I led, I multiplied, I gave. It's all of God. There is no place in this passage for human pride. One of our elders, Jim Frazier, was, will... Uh, periodically remind us of something Dr. Johnson said late in his life. It was that if you remember nothing else of what he taught, remember your inability. And there's nothing more humbling than that, and nothing more basic and true. We are sinners without exception. We don't like to hear that because it means that we're not only guilty, we're incapable. We're not only guilty, we're helpless. We're unable. One of the greatest debates in the history of the church was over this issue. It happened when Augustine wrote a prayer in his spiritual autobiography, The Confessions. The prayer is, All my hope is found solely in your exceeding great mercy, Give what you command and command what you will. Meaning, Lord, you are sovereign and I'm not. I'm helpless. I cannot do what you command unless you give to me what you command. Then command whatever you will and I will obey. In other words, Lord, I can't do anything good apart from your mercy. Give me mercy. Well, there was a British monk who came to Rome and had an influential ministry there. His name was Pelagius. Now, we had a Sunday school lesson a few weeks ago on much of this very thing that I'm saying here. It's an excellent lesson. I'm reminding you of that. Pelagius was a man of self-discipline, a man of piety. In fact, Augustine had respect for him because of the morality that he urged upon the church. But when he read that line in the Confessions, he became furious. Of course we can do good. Of course we can do what God commands. If He commands us, we can do it. He wouldn't command us if we didn't have the ability. 
We have the ability to obey. In fact, Pelagius said we can even become perfect. He was what Bunyan would call Mr. Legality and Mr. Morality. We earn God's approval by our deeds. Well, it, it set off a debate that continues down to this day between those two who believe uh, these two kinds of people, those two people and people like them who believe in either total inability or believe in human ability. Sovereign grace versus human merit. This has always divided men. It divided two men in the temple that Jesus spoke of in Luke chapter 18. The Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee prided himself on his deeds. He looked up to heaven and he said, I fast and I pray and I pay tithes. Thank you. I'm not like that tax collector. And the tax collector couldn't even look up to heaven. He looked down and he beat his chest saying, God be merciful to me the sinner. Now that's the difference between humble Augustine and prideful Pelagius. And we might ask, that's church history. Where do the scriptures side on this issue? Well, there are many texts that I could read to you, but Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God made us alive together with Christ Jesus. You were dead, but God. He is the difference. He did that for Augustine. He did that for the tax collector. He did it for Abraham when he was lost in Ur, worshiping idols. He shined his light into his dark heart and he made him alive, gave him a call, commanded him, and gave him the ability to respond in faith. Remember your inability and God's great grace to make us able. He made Abraham and Sarah able. They came out of idolatry and He led them out of Ur and into Canaan. Then the Lord blessed them with descendants. When Abraham was too old to beget a child, 99 years old, and Sarah was unable to conceive, God gave them Isaac, a miracle of God's sovereign grace. Again, Joshua recalled this for Israel so that they would think on what they should think upon, and that is God's grace, and would be moved by that to gratitude and devotion and to worship Him. That's what grace should do. It should move us to selfless service to Him, to adoration of Him. Well, this emphasis on Sovereign grace continues in verse 4 to Isaac, the miracle child. God gave twins when Rebekah, his wife, was unable to conceive. Jacob and Esau. Not Esau and Jacob. The order is important, you know, because Jacob was the younger brother. He was the second born. And yet here he's listed first, showing the fulfillment of God's choice of him over Esau, the firstborn, the rightful, or at least the expected heir. Now, Paul develops this in Romans 9, verse 11, that while the two were still in the womb, before either had done anything good or bad, there's nothing in them to uh, influence God's choice, in other words. They'd done nothing, good or bad, that's when God chose the one over the other. So again, there's the reminder of the nation's origin in God's undeserved love, in God's sovereign grace. Jacob, through whom Israel tra traces its descent, was no better than his brother Esau. Both came from the same womb at the same time, yet the younger was chosen over the older. That's sovereign grace, distinguishing grace, not heritage or merit or deeds, just the opposite. God was good to Esau. He didn't neglect him. In fact, he gave Esau just what Esau wanted. 
He gave him Mount Seir to possess, which is Edom. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt, Joshua says. Now, where's the grace in that? The Lord gave Esau a place. He gave him a nation. He gave him a people. But he gave nothing to his chosen people, at least not immediately. Instead, he led them into a foreign land down to Egypt. It was a place of affliction. Moses called Egypt the iron furnace, a place where Israel was enslaved and without any appearance of being the elect people. But it was in Egypt that they grew into a nation. And through affliction, they were given the desire to leave that land and to go to Canaan. Affliction is not a sign of rejection or disfavor. Uh, it, it is an evidence of God's choice of us. It's an evidence of sonship. Often God puts His elect into the iron furnace, not for evil, but for good. Even there in Egypt, in some lonely place where He may place us, He is with us. He is refining us. He is preparing us through all of that to come out of this world and into the promised land, into the heavenly land, teaching us that this world is not our home and we're not to invest in this place and live for this place. He did that for Israel. And at the right time, the Lord says in verse 5, I sent Moses and Aaron and I plagued Egypt by what I did in its midst. And afterward, I brought you out. Verse 6, I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And Egypt pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. But when they cried out to the Lord, He put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your own eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness for a long time. That's all a summary of the miracles of the Exodus, really the uh, first 40 years from the Exodus to coming into Canaan. But it, enough is said here to remind them of God's almighty power and His great mercy. You lived in that desert for a long time, and it was to bring to reflection how God provided for them every day, every morning, every evening. At, at all 24 hours, He took care of them. And what a testimony this is. Israel, in contrast to Egypt, a nation of slaves, overcame an empire and its army. That, that can only be explained as supernatural. They were slaves, but God gave them freedom. And so it is for every believer in Jesus Christ. We're not where we are because of any wise and godly heritage that, that may have an influence. In fact, there's no greater blessing for a child than to be born into a Christian home and come under the wisdom and influence of Christian parents. That very, very often has a great glorious outcome. It's a great blessing, but it's not spiritual credit put to our account. We don't live on the faith of our parents or our grandparents. We entered the world, every one of us, guilty, without merit, enslaved to sin until God set us free. With the blessings Christ obtained on the cross that were applied to us by the Spirit of God, and we believed. And then we were free indeed. John Newton, the former slave trader, Reminded himself of that every day. Reminded himself of the grace of God that snatched him from that horrible profession and made him a child of God and made him a great preacher of the gospel, a hymn writer. And he did that by putting the text of Deuteronomy 15.15 15 in large letters over his mantle in his London home. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Well, he did that for all of us if we're believers in Jesus Christ. 
And having redeemed Israel, set them free, he then gave them victory after victory. And in verses 8 through 10, Joshua reviews their conquest of the kings east of the Jordan River. The first to fall were the Amorites, Sion and Og, referred to in verse 8, where God says, I brought you into the land, and I gave them your land, I, and I gave them into your hand. Again, e emphasis is on what the Lord did. He brought, he destroyed. So Israel occupied. When the Moabites tried to fight Israel with magic and hired the false prophet Balaam to curse the nation, God turned his curses into blessings. Well, that's not only an example of God's greatness, the greatness of his power, but of his goodness. The goodness of his purpose toward them, the goodness of his purpose toward us. He will use the enemy's attacks on us for our good. He turns a curse into a blessing. The greatest example of that is the cross. It was Satan's attack on Christ. It was Satan's attack on us, on the elect. But it became the Lord's triumph over the devil. It's where he defeated, defeated him and sin and won our salvation. God turned the enemy's curse into our blessing. Christ's wounds into our healing. And Joshua reminds Israel of that blessing of God on them. God gave victory over the enemy east of the Jordan and west of the Jordan. Verse 11, you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the citizens of Jericho fought against you and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Girgashite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Thus I gave them into your hand. Well, that's a, a, a summary of the first 12 chapters of the book of Joshua. But again, the emphasis is on the Lord's victory. I gave them into your hand. And as he said in verse 12, it's... It's not Israel's skill with the, the sword and bow. The land that these armies of Israel gained was a gift of God to them. And to impress that on the people, God, uh, God describes Canaan according to the promises that He made in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 through 11. And Joshua summarizes that in verse 13. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities which you had not built, and you lived in them, and you are eating of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. God promised that before they entered the land, and He delivered. That was His gift to the people who originated in idolatry beyond the river. His gift was both, was both generous and undeserved. So now Joshua arrives at the, the principal point of his address. If these things are so, and the people had witnessed all of them, then they call for a response of faith and obedience. Call for a, a response of of not simply obedience outwardly, but inward obedience. It call for a response of devotion. Verse 14, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. What an amazing statement. Put away the gods. They were carrying idols. Now this was the faithful generation. They weren't like their fathers who had worshipped the golden calf and wanted to go back to Egypt. This is the generation of Israelites that was faithful. They had witnessed all of the amazing things that Joshua recalled here. They had experienced God's provision and protection all their lives. Every day, God had sustained them in the wilderness with manna from heaven. They called it the bread of angels, angel food. 
He gave them water to drink in the desert. They witnessed His power. They experienced His faithfulness every day. And all along, they were carrying idols, false gods. They had a divided heart. So now Joshua says, enough of that. Throw away the idols and serve the Lord. But then he adds in verse 15, if that is disagreeable to you, if serving the Lord is not appealing, if you like the false gods, then you must choose whom you will serve. Now listen, the question is not, will we or won't we serve? It never is. We all serve. The question is, what will we serve? We either serve the Lord or we serve a false god. We either serve the Lord or an idol or our lust or our appetites, but we all serve. Joshua was experienced enough as a preacher to know he couldn't make them do the right thing. All he could do was give them the Word of God. All he could do was remind them of the truth and point them in the right direction. They had to choose. So he, he told them to do that. Make your choice. The gods of Abraham, the gods that he left behind at the river, the gods they were carrying through Canaan, or the true God who was carrying them. Choose today, he said. And that really gives the lie to the objection against Augustine's prayer, the kind of objection we often hear against uh, inability of, uh, of man, against uh, the doctrines of predestination and election. The objection which is, well, that makes us robots. Can't be. Can't be true because otherwise we'd just be automatons. Well, that's nonsense. No one believes that. That's what you call a straw man a false representation of the truth. Everyone uses their mind. They process truth. They, they make decisions. And, and those decisions are real decisions, genuine decisions. People reflect upon something, and then they make their decisions, and they act upon that. The problem is no one can make the right decision apart from the sovereign grace of God. Because sin has so affected man's mind and man's will that it is in effect bent toward evil. Not good. And man can't straighten it out. And so he naturally understands and acts upon that bent mind and will and chooses wrongly all the time. As a result of that condition, our mind is darkened. We're described as blind. We can't see. We can't understand. Nevertheless, we are responsible to believe. And there is power in God's Word. It penetrates the darkened heart. It gives light and ability. It's supernatural. But that light breaks upon the heart of individuals and, and they see the truth. Joshua gave truth. He gave light. He told them to respond. And people do. This is how they do respond. They hear the Word of God. They hear the truth of God. And it has an effect because it's a supernatural Word. And that simply means that the Word of God, the Bible, is attended by the Spirit of God. He's always at work in it. That's the miracle. People respond. Light comes into darkness. That's the invisible power and work of the Lord in the heart of man. And it is what the Lord said Himself in Matthew 19, verse 26, after telling the disciples that it, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were astonished these disciples. The, the rich were those whom heaven had smiled on, the, the people with all of the advantages and the privileges one could have. And so they said, then who can be saved? If the rich can't get into heaven, what about us poor souls? Us lowly fishermen and tax collectors? And Jesus answered, with people this is impossible. 
Well, there's, there's the inability of man. He, he could not have put it any more forcefully, more even than Augustine did in his prayer. Impossible with man. But he added, with God all things are possible. And there's the hope, and there's the certainty that we have. God is gracious, and abundantly gracious, so much so that He seeks those who do not seek Him, as He did with Abraham, the idolater. Found Him in darkness, saved Him, and brought Him out. So, Joshua, knowing the grace of God and power of His Word, appealed to the nation's conscience and said to the people, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. But whatever they chose, the God who carried them or the gods that they carried, he says he'd already made his choice. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And of course, after all that he had said in this sermon about God's unconditional love and grace, His power, His provision and protection, that was the obvious choice. That was the right choice. That's the only choice. But this is the choice that is always before us. It's the choice that we face this morning and the later today and every day. Uh, whether it's New Year's or every day, we face this choice. Who will we serve, the Lord or the idols? And you wonder, how is it possible that the Israelites, this faithful generation, had idols? But it was. They did. And it's possible for us today. I'm talking about believers to have these idols John ended his first epistle with the warning, little children, guard yourselves from idols. Paul, I think, is very similar to what he said in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. It pulls on us. There are idols in this world. The 21st century has all kinds of idols that attract us. They are whatever take the place of the Lord God in our heart. Whatever captures our hearts, whatever captures our affection and interest and controls our time and behavior. It's different things for different people. Things that may not be bad in and of themselves, in fact, may be good in and of themselves, but they have displaced the Lord as our primary object of affection as the one who has our thoughts, our time, our activity. So, we, we need self-examination to choose who or what we will serve today. And yet the only way to put away the gods of this world from our hearts is to see the beauty and the reality of the Lord God, the true God. I've spoken before of Thomas Chalmers, the 19th century Scot and theologian who wrote a little book. It was actually a lecture or a sermon that he delivered titled The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. And really the title says it all. The expulsive power is love. It's our love for the Lord. When we see the Lord's glory, His beauty, and we recognize His power, and realize that He has given us everything that we possess from temporal life to eternal life, when we begin to see this, then we love Him. We will love Him and serve Him because He loved us and blessed us. He called us out of darkness. He called us out of deception and death. Every bit as much as He called Abraham and Sarah out of idolatry. That's the unconditional, un sought love of God. That's John 3.16. For God so loved the world. He loved a fallen world of rebels who had rejected Him. He didn't reject us. He sent His Son to die for us and redeem us, save us, pluck us like brands from the burning, and He will keep us, never leave us, 
and bring us safely into the promised land. That's grace. And as we think on it, and think on it often, and we will do that if we are diligent students of God's Word and we read it and continually live in it and see the greatness and the glory of God, then it will produce within us gratitude and a desire to know Him more and serve Him more faithfully and worship Him and honor Him. That's the only way we will come to that mature understanding of Him and right behavior through the Word of God. Well, if there's someone here who has taken the time to come to this place this morning, but has not believed in Jesus Christ for salvation, then the charge of Joshua is for you too. Just as he told Israel, choose for yourself today whom you will serve. Make a decision today. You need to do that. You need to make that decision now. You may not have tomorrow. You may not have the rest of this day. You don't know. James tells us we're just a vapor. We may be gone in a moment. So choose today whom you will serve. Trust in Christ, the Son of God, and only Savior of mankind. He died for sinners in the place of all who trust in Him. So look to Him. Believe and be saved. That's what He invites the sinner to do. And it's all that we can do. Believe in Him. Rest in Him. And then you will be able to do like Joshua. Serve the Lord. Let's bow in a word of prayer. And... And then we will seek the Lord's blessing on us as we take the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your goodness to us. We thank You for this great text of Scripture, this great challenge that Joshua gave to the nation. And it's for us as well. We are so tempted by the things we see around us, and, and we invite that stuff into our hearts. We do so sometimes unwittingly. Before we know it, we're caught up in, in things that distract us from you. Maybe good things, but nevertheless, not the best things. So Lord, we pray that you would arrest us and bring us into greater conformity to you and give us a greater love for you. May we have a desire to read your word. And as we read it, would you, would you through the Spirit of God, Enlighten us and give us a great understanding and a great love for you. You have blessed us beyond anything we can ever comprehend. But help us to begin comprehending it. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for this time now. Bless it as we remember him and his death for us. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, let's uh, stand and sing number 40. Arise, my soul. Number 40. We've been reminded again of the faithfulness of God to his promises, which he has exhibited from the beginning of time and is, is the sure confidence we have for eternity. And the Lord's Supper is an ongoing reminder to us of that. Uh, Dan has taught us more than once uh, the meaning of, uh, Joshua's name. It means the Lord saves or the Lord is salvation and it corresponds to, you know this, the New Testament name uh, Jesus. We know from the birth narratives of the Gospels that the angel said to uh, Joshua, to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And in the man Joshua's total devotion, devotion to the Lord, he served as a useful type of the Lord Jesus, who through his own devotion to the Father and his commitment to do the Father's will, uh, brought deliverance and victory uh, to all who belong to him. And we're going to see in the passage in Joshua next week, we hate to see it end, Dan, uh, but a choice made by the people. Joshua has called for that choice, uh, for a decision to be uh, rendered, to follow after the Lord and be obedient to him. History will reveal that 
uh, decision to be weak in faith, faint at best. But in a similar fashion, when we observe uh, the Lord's Supper and when we partake of the bread and of the wine, we indicate ourselves that we have decided for Christ. That is, we memorialize with these physical elements the sacrifice made by God's Son to bring forgiveness of sins and deliverance from God's judgment on account of the perfection of the sa sacrifice made on the cross. And Jesus made that plain when he took the bread and he said, this is my body uh, given for you. Uh, uh, Dan phrased it this way in his sermon this morning, Christ's wounds given for our healing. And likewise, when he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, he identified his own blood poured out to death as the sacrifice that atoned for our sins. And that, Je that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me is an enduring signal to all who would participate in his supper to understand what we are doing now uh, is a memorial to his person and work. And on a less significant level, we also memorialize our own faith, our own individual decisions made to trust in Christ alone by actively partaking now of the bread and the wine. This is our witness. This is our confession of faith. And so we ask all who are with us uh, this morning or listening in some capa one capacity or another and who have trusted in Christ alone for salvation from your sins to join with us in faith and public confession that he is our Savior. Let me give thanks for the bread. Father, we do uh, thank you now for this weekly privilege that we have in obedience to your own command on the night you were betrayed, the Gospels tell us. You took bread and you broke it and you gave it to them and you said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. And so we thank you for the opportunity that this is for us to pause uh, here at the end of the sermon uh, and take this and in, by taking it uh, indicate to you, yes, we will follow the Lord. Yes, uh, we belong to Christ. Yes, uh, we are trusting in his sacrifice for us alone for forgiveness, for deliverance, for salvation. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read from Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. <clears throat> who are the weary? Later in chapter 23, verse 4, Jesus describes the Pharisees laying heavy burdens on men's shoulders, a reference to all the legal demands that uh, they would put on people. The law makes impossible demands. Impossible because they're impossible to keep. And then... You can add to that a religion that the Pharisees had developed, which gave more rules to perform and gain God's approval. That's a wearying life to be under, to try to gain God's approval by our own behavior. It's impossible. Well, those are the weary. But also there are those who are weary from guilt due to sin, sin that they committed and they cannot take back. They cannot remove. And guilt is a heavy burden. Jesus was saying that he alone could remove 
sin and give rest. That's really an amazing statement when you consider it. It's easy to read something like this and just move through it without giving a lot of thought. But can you imagine someone standing in this pulpit and inviting you to come to him and he'll give you eternal rest and he will take care of all of your burdens. We think that was blasphemy, which it would be. That's what the Lord said. And he could say it and he could do it because he is perfect man and eternal God. And at the cross, all of our sins and burdens were put on him. And he bore their punishment in our place. And that's true for every believer in Christ. We now have rest from the toil of law keeping and the nagging guilt of sin. We can live free, we can live obediently. Because as sons and daughters of God, He enables us to do that. Well, that's what Christ gained for us at the cross. And that's what we're reminded of, in part, by the cup. So let's give thanks for the Lord's suffering in our place, the shedding of His blood, which this cup represents. Father, we thank You for that. Thank You that Your Son went to the cross for us willingly, for the joy set before Him, the joy of doing Your will, the joy of obtaining a people for Himself. We thank You for that. Thank You for Your grace. Thank You for the sacrifice of Your Son. It's in His name we pray. Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank You for Your goodness and Your grace that we've considered this morning and that we've celebrated with this supper, the sacrifice of Your Son. Thank you for all that we have in Christ. We are rich indeed. We have a glorious and eternal future through your gift to us. Thank you for that. And now, Lord, we pray that you would bless us as we go, protect us throughout the week, and bring us back safely next week. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.